Welcome. Hi, I'm Puya from Giant Swarm. I'm going to be the host for this last session. This is Dan from Cilium, uh, from ISOValent. And he's going to talk. Everyone makes that mistake. <laughs> and he's going to talk about eBPF and security tonight. So. Cool. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Last session of the day. So, as people still filter in, I wanted to get a couple warm up questions to get the juices flowing. So, how many of you have heard of BPF already? All right. It's a good number. How many of you want to give a 30, 35 minute talk on it? If anyone? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so, cool. And how many of you are running something on BPF today? Anyone? All right. All right. So, that's a, that's a pretty good split. You know, I was. Um, at KubeCon, uh, KubeCon two years ago, we used to joke, it was BPF what? You know, it was the answer we got every time we told someone we were doing BPF. And I think now it's more and more people are already aware of it, um, but eager to learn more. So definitely excited uh, to get this kicked off. So a bit about me. So um, I've been working in open source networking and security for the last 10 plus years. Started out at a company called NYSERA which created Open vSwitch. So we were doing a lot of the software-defined uh, networking inside of Linux and the Linux kernel. Um, we were very involved in OpenStack. I created and led the OpenStack networking project. And then NYSERA was bought by VMware, and that's the technology that became VMware NSX. And you know, what we did with Open vSwitch was very much take the traditional network abstractions, IPs, ports, routers, firewalls, and we made them programmable in software. But where I really think the world is going now is rethinking those core networking abstractions, going beyond IPs and ports. And I think BPF is a fundamental capability that will help us get there. And that's what the open source Cilium project is all about. So that's what we're focused on now. Um, I'm a co-founder along with uh, Thomas Graff of a company called Isovalent, or the company behind Cilium. So the purpose of this talk um, was about how we can use BPF to bring Kubernetes awareness to, the tr to Linux kernel and Linux kernel security. And it's not so much about securing Linux. It's not so much about securing Kubernetes. It's about securing the apps running on top of Kubernetes. How can you make it so that it's not just agility as a reason why people want to put their apps on Kubernetes. Putting your app on Kubernetes actually makes it dramatically more secure than running it in any, in any other way. That's effectively the goal. So as a bit of context, Linux is what we call a general purpose operating system, right? It can run on everything from this you know, tiny little Raspberry Pi that's this big to your phone to a laptop to some servers. And now most of our Linux instances aren't even running on gear we have access to. They're running in the cloud. But if you think about the core abstractions that, that most of your applications use, they're general purpose operating abstract abstractions that have existed since the 70s and 80s. Things like processes, files, IP addresses, TCP, IP ports. So, you know, that makes sense if you can make no assumptions about the type of workload that are running on top of your operating system. You should provide general purpose abstractions. But the question we're thinking about is let's assume we're running microservices applications, like we're all building today, running on Kubernetes. What could we do inside of Linux to make those applications dramatically more secure? So if we're talking about security, we have to talk about what type of security we're, we're focusing on. Particularly, we're focusing on runtime security attacks here. A runtime security attack is something that happens as the application is running. Right? You have a set of services. You have some data stores, maybe some external APIs. The application team has some idea of how that, the code execution and the data flow is supposed to work right? when things are well behaved. A user comes there. They just see their data. They get access to it. The backups go over here, and no one accesses those backups. Right? We all know that attacks happen when a malicious actor finds an alternative execution path or data flow that's different than what the application, intend, application team intended, but it's still permitted by the infrastructure. Right? So if any of you have seen a Cilium talk before, we like to weave in Star Wars to pretty much all of our demos. So here's my analogy for what a runtime attack is. Right? You, know, you are just doing your job, working in you know, the galaxy's largest battle station. right? You get a prisoner transfer from cell block B. Looks perfectly normal, right? Just bring in some Wookiee in here who's been misbehaving, right? Next thing you know, the helmets pop off, the blasters are firing, you know, and the most you know, precious prisoner in the entire galaxy has escaped, right? It's the same thing, right? There's a set of 
expected behaviors. The attack starts out looking like an expected behavior. It takes a different execution and data flow, and that's an attack. All right. You know, I just definitely would not want to be the, you know, imperial person who's in that retrospective of that security incident, right? Probably not end well for that person. Right, so what should security be doing, right? Security should be preventing these invalid execution and data flows, right? But preventing stuff isn't good enough, right? You have to do it in a way that application teams don't experience friction. They can still move as fast as they want to. But they can deliver their applications with full speed. And that's ultimately what I think is so cool about BPF and the potential of BPF for Kubernetes aware security, is that it's not just about um, you know, being more secure, it's about being more secure in a way that's very low friction and doesn't get in the way of your application developers. So with that, we'll transition from uh, Star Wars to very low level kernel technology. What is BPF? BPF stands for Berkeley Packet Filter. It's also called eBPF. Today, those two names can be roughly used interchangeably. Essentially, it's a highly efficient sandbox virtual machine inside the kernel. Now, this is kind of a computer scientist notion of a virtual machine. It's not really like a VMware VM. And there, what they mean is that the code is sandboxed so that it can't do things that it shouldn't. All right? And we'll talk more about that in a second, but largely, like, TC, you know, it was originally used by TCP dump. If you've ever run TCP dump and you passed it a filter, right? They didn't want all those packets copied up to user space and then filtered, so they wanted to be able to filter it in the kernel. So they needed to be able to dynamically generate code in the kernel that could filter those packets. Um, but they didn't want if that code had a bug in it or, a secure, or was written by a malicious actor, they didn't want it to crash the kernel or do other bad things. So it's sandboxed from a can't do bad things perspective, but it's actually natively compiled to run at full performance just like the feature was compiled into the kernel. So what this means is that we can take any existing Linux distro, right, as long as it's modern enough and has good BPF support, 4.9 is, is a kind of a, a common barrier we use for Cilium, right? And I can now dynamically put my hooks in there to add Kubernetes and microservices-aware intelligence and turn that distro into a microservices-aware distro. So first off, two key concepts to cover on BPF. The first is programs and hook points. So you can think of BPF largely as a function as a service for the kernel. It's kind of like AWS Lambda in the sense that an event happens and a set of code executes. These events are not you know, external things. They're actually certain calls happening in the kernel. For example, each time a new TCP packet is created, right, I can run some code that runs logic there. Each time someone makes a particular syscall, I can run logic. Right? And that logic runs with these very strong safety guarantees, but still with native performance. So I can write a BPF program. It's written in this kind of pseudo C language. You can compile it to BPF bytecode. There's a BPF system call that you use to load that into the kernel, and you tell it what hook point you want to use. Before the kernel will run your code, it will first send it through a verifier. Again, this is how the sandboxing happens, to make sure that that code can't do anything malicious to your kernel. It can only access data that it should, right? And then that hook point gets, or sorry, that code gets attached to the hook point that you've requested. And then so when the kernel code is executing, right, maybe your hook point is at that function right there, the kernel's gonna execute to that point, then it's gonna jump to your code, passing it the associated data that that kernel function had access to. You can do whatever processing you want, and then the kernel will continue to process. And this is a very lightweight operation, right? So, cool, we can now put logic that runs at any point in the kernel, right, and add our own intelligence there. But the second thing you need is that, listen, if you just run code and it goes away, you need some place to keep state, right? How do I keep track of things? Where do I have my configuration? That's BPF maps. So BPF map is essentially, there's a couple variants, but you can think of them essentially as arrays and hash tables that your BPF programs can access. And they can read to them, they can write to them, and they persist beyond the lifetime of an individual execution of your BPF program. So why do we care about BPF maps? Well, BPF maps can both be written by the BPF programs that are running in the kernel, but also by BPF aware tools that are running in user space. And it's done using something called the BPF file system. So they're a very highly efficient mechanism of getting things in and out. So there's two examples, right? So 
I may want to pass configuration or rules. Let's imagine my BPF program is implementing a high performance DDoS filter. How do I pass down the set of IPs that should be blocked by that DDoS filter? Right, I can use a BPF map to very incrementally update in real time without loading and unloading that BPF program. So it's a highly efficient way of incrementally pushing things down. It's also a very efficient way of BPF programs accumulating data in the kernel, as opposed to them having to pass each event up to user space for processing. This is why BPF is used in a lot of cases for performance monitoring, right? Because it can do things in a very lightweight way in the kernel. So putting it all together, right, you have some application workload. It makes a syscall like connect. That's going to send data through the kernel networking stack and out the E0 interface. Right? We can have a hook point there in the TCP IP stack that lets us see every bit of data that's flowing between that application workload and the outside world. And we can build our own BPF program, attach it to that hook point, we compile it to the bytecode, load it with the BPF syscall. Right? The kernel will verify that we're doing only safe things, we're only accessing that packet data, for example. Right? Then each time there's a packet that goes through, right, that BPF program will be invoked. We could add additional visibility metrics. We could add filtering. We can modify that packet. We can do anything we want to that packet data. Right? And then if necessary, we can pass things up or bring things in via BPF maps. So this is a very, very generic capability. Right? BPF can be used for all kinds of things. All right? So some of the more common public um, you know, BPF projects that have been out there, Facebook has talked a lot about what they do, both for performance visibility and for their open source Contron L304 load balancer. Very high performance using BPF. Google has talked publicly about both quality of service and traffic optimization use cases, performance monitoring, and network security. Red Hat is looking very closely at this, um, both from an NFV uh, perspective, but also doing upstream work in the Linux kernel to actually replace IP tables with an underlying BPF-based mechanism because it's so much more performant. And then if any of you have heard of uh, like Brendan Gregg and uh, the flame graphs and all like, Brendan is leading a group at Netflix on performance engineering that's done a lot of very cool work, um, basically performance troubleshooting, tracing, um, systems monitoring. So BPF itself is a very generic capability, very powerful. If you want to get into the weeds on BPF, if you want to you know, see a version of documentation where on the second page they're already talking at a register level, I would encourage you to check out um, this, this stuff that was written by some of our upstream developers um, in the Linux kernel. One of our team members, Daniel Borkman, wrote this, who co-maintains other stuff in, in, uh, in the Linux kernel along with some folks from Facebook. But all of the detail you wanted more uh, are, is in those docs. I won't go any deeper, but there's also a BPF channel on the Cilium Slack that you can hop on and ask any very detailed questions there. So for most of us who aren't going to spend our time worrying about registers and low-level bytecode, right, how can we use BPF? There's really two big buckets of, of ways that you can use BPF. First off, there's kind of toolkits and tool chains for building your own BPF programs and running them. So who's heard of BCC before? BCC is probably the most common example of a kind of standard tool chain, you can actually write your own BPF logic. It makes it simple to do that whole process of compiling it, loading it into the kernel, getting data out of the kernel via BPF maps without you having to get your hands very dirty. BPF is very general purpose. It's a great tool for kind of rapidly prototyping things or getting great performance visibility. There's also a couple things they built now called BPF Tool and BPF Trace and, um, and Kubectl Trace now that have made it easier to run these programs um, even in Kubernetes environments. Then there's programs and technologies that are built using BPF. Cilium, which we build as an open source project, is one example. Weave, Sysdig, uh, Vector is a, is a Netflix um, performance monitoring tool. In this case, you're not really dealing directly with BPF. You never have to write pseudo C code or deal with it. You're giving high level abstractions, right? But BPF makes these technologies more powerful underneath the hood. They give you better performance, they give you deeper visibility, et cetera but you're not mucking with low-level details. So it really depends what you want. Do you want kind of a complete solution, or are you looking to prototype and, and play with BPF? Both of these can be very useful. Actually, both of these types of things we'll use in the demo today. So we'll use BCC to add some kernel hook points and trace points, 
and feed that information into Cilium, um, which will then do network visibility and enforcement. So a bit of context on, you know, why BPF for network security. So, you know, most of you are probably familiar with IP tables. It's the firewall that's existed in Linux for the last 20 plus years, right? It's designed very much for a world where there are administrators manually typing in a command line, writing out a couple firewall rule sets for an environment that changed very rarely. That's nothing like um, what we have today in Kubernetes, right? And Kubernetes pods are coming and going. You can have many, many pods. You can have, you know, services lists that get into the thousands and tens of thousands, right? IP tables was not really designed for that type of scale. Likewise, it was fundamentally designed around IPs and ports. And if you know anything about Kubernetes networking, right, IPs are very ephemeral in the Kubernetes environment. They're coming and going. They're not meaningful long-term identity. What you really care about for identity are things like Kubernetes labels, right, and IP addresses. And so with BPF and Cilium, we're able to kind of natively build an understanding of Kubernetes identity into the kernel processing layer, both from an enforcement perspective and from a visibility perspective. All right. So this is not an intro to Cilium talk. I'll have one slide that kind of gives you an overview. Um, Cilium, again, is kind of service and API aware um, networking and security for Kubernetes. It's open source. It's built on BPF. We do a lot to, as I mentioned, kind of elevate the notion of identity from an IP address to things that are more meaningful in a cloud native world. We also work with Envoy to give you API aware security. We accelerate getting that traffic in and out of Envoy, so it's very efficient. We've done a ton of work to be more performant and more scalable in larger clusters um, compared to using something like IP tables. We've also done a, we had a cool talk at, at KubeCon Seattle around multi-cluster routing. Um, and security, that's how you create a single mesh of routing and security across multiple clusters of Kubernetes. We also have what we call universal encryption, you know, set one config option, all of your pod to pod traffic is encrypted. The thing we do in Cilium is fully transparent to the apps. There's no like sidecars or anything. That's part of the power of BPF, right? The traffic is just going through the kernel. We can grab it with BPF and do whatever we need to it without requiring the application team to be even aware that we're doing that, right? So definitely, if you're interested in Cilium more broadly um, or any of these topics, swing by the booth. Um, you come in the, 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 the expo hall. You go past Red Hat, which is one of the first ones. Just take a left. We're right there. But in general, the rest of the talk is going to focus um, very specifically on a particular set of use cases. So swinging back to what we talked about earlier, right? We talked about runtime attacks being when there's a certain set of expected flows in terms of execution and data, and the attackers manage to manipulate the existing set of application code to essentially take a different path than what the application developers intended, but one that's still allowed by the underlying operating system and other infrastructure. So let's look at a couple concrete examples of how this has happened in Kubernetes. So obviously the most you know, upfront thing you think of is, well, maybe the main service I'm building and deploying has a bug in it. All right, there's a really interesting example up here on HackerOne Hacker One's a very cool site that can be used to kind of, instead of essentially bounties for penetration testing. And this is a really informative example. I give tons of credit to the companies that both are, you know, using this as a mechanism for their penetration testing, but also sharing that knowledge and learning with everyone else. So props to everyone um, who's using Hacker One. I'm not trying to call them out as a bad thing here. Um, but this is a really cool example of a server-side request forgery, right, where the application was getting in a URL and they were going to go down on the internet and download it to use it as like an icon in your shop, right? But it turns out you could actually pass in a URL that referenced the AWS metadata service, right? And they would reach out to the AWS metadata service, and they would grab the keys there. And then you could get root, for example, in their entire Kubernetes cluster. So it's a good example, right, of how there was an intended use for what was going on. The hackers were clever, figured out another path of execution flow, right, that ended up compromising the entire cluster. Now, of course, there's other options than the buggy or malicious main service. There's actually buggy malicious sidecars or init containers. So sidecars are essentially helper containers that run in the same Kubernetes pod. Init containers are small containers that run right at, um, right at container start time. And so, you know, this might have logging, you know, logging agent, for example. But the reality is, if that logging agent gets compromised, what else does that have access to? Right? You have to think about... Um, 
your attack surface there. Right? There's no kind of amount of code that's too small to potentially have a security relevant bug in it. Right? In fact, curl, this is a good example I have here, curl, right? it's like the simplest thing you could possibly ever do in a container practically is curl a URL. Right? Actually has had a remote execution vulnerability there. Right? You just have to assume that at some point your app, you know, some app in your environment is going to be compromised. You have to decide how you contain that blast radius. And then finally, it's not just the software that's a problem. People are problems, too. You and me, we're problems. Right? We get access to these systems because we need to troubleshoot them. Right? But when I kubectl you know, exec into my front end, it turns out I also may have access to the database, and I could just use that access to go grab all of that information, right? Because my front end needed access to that database, so now when I kubectl exec in, I have access to that database, right? So again, it's a, there's a reason that flow is there, but the attack uses that same access for an unintended reason to expose data, right? So the analogy I like to think is, you know, there's general purpose operating systems. Let's imagine, you know, as part of KubeCon, you get a bottle of wine, and you have to ship it back um, to wherever you are. Right, if you get a general purpose box and some general purpose packing materials, right, you're gonna, there's a lot of degrees of freedom in there that that thing can move around. It's the same thing with an app. Right? You, know, you know what the app is supposed to do. It's supposed to stay there. But if someone in the shipping company throws that thing around, that's going to go all over the place. Right? So what do you do? Well, you take you know, packing tape and bubble wrap and all this kind of stuff. You try to close up that space between the general purpose box and your actual... <laughs> All right. Not quite yet. All right. Give me a couple minutes. I'm not late, right? <laughs> All right. What you're trying to do from a security perspective is kind of constrain that thing and right and put 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 boundaries around it. But with a general purpose operating system, it's hard because there's a lot of surface and degrees where this thing could move. Right. So really what I think of when I think of like trying to design an operating system that's optimized for microservices, I think about those perfect wine carrier boxes they have, right? They're designed to be carrying wine, right? There's no degrees of freedom. It's perfectly formed and, and kind of managed to be exactly carrying that type of a workload and to be minimizing damage. So that's essentially, I think, what we want to do with, with BPF. We want to understand the form of your application and we want to constrain it to that exact space so that attackers don't have all this extra degrees of freedom to manipulate and go down paths um, that you're not supposed to. So what is it about microservices, and particularly Kubernetes-based microservices, that we could take advantage of right, to lock them down much more tightly than just any old process running in Linux? Well, there's a lot of things, actually, it turns out. And you know, in my view, it's kind of all in the name, microservices. So what does the micro and microservice mean? right? It means you're not running a, you know, a single container with lots of stuff in it. You're trying to strip it down to some basic um, unit of work. Most containers, right, have, most pods have a single main container, right? It launches some, you know, often web server. It could be a data store like Redis. It could be, you know, Apache, et cetera, as PID1. That may fork a set of things, but it's much different than think about my laptop, right, where I'm running a bunch of different processes. It's unclear who to trust. It's actually a very sane and clean environment. Right? There's not much interesting that should be happening inside of a container if you've designed it properly as a microservice. Plus, debug access, things like kubectl exec, actually happens, and from an operating system, we can tell the difference between someone coming in with a kubectl exec and making a network call and the main process making that network call. We're actually able to give those two different things different permissions. The second thing that's huge is it's fully immutable infrastructure and code. Right? You don't go in there, at least you shouldn't, right? <laughs> and update the version of Apache that's running inside your container. Right? No, you blow those pods away, you deploy a new pod. Right? So there's no complex application or process lifecycle to deal with. Right? It's very simple. Right? Plus, if I do need to package additional things and have additional processes to run in there, I actually run them as sidecars or init containers. And that, again, gives us a very clean packaging environment we can tell what that sidecar needs to do and allow it to just do that, right? And not give it the same access as, as, the, main, as the main process. Then on the service side, right, you know, again, I mentioned that typically, you know, an operating system would understand IPs. IPs aren't very meaningful here. What you really care about is what are the services 
that this, that this microservice is supposed to talk to. We want to give it access just to those services, not, for example, to every IP out there. Right? Plus, you know, ideally, we can actually get API-level visibility. Right? We're not going to cover this in this talk right now because it's only a 35-minute talk. But Cilium gives you visibility into things like HTTP, gRPC, and Kafka. So you don't have to open up an entire port and say, hey, you can make every API call here. You can actually say, no, you can go put to slash foo, right? Or you can post, you know, you can produce to this Kafka topic. Actually, understanding those semantics let us lock things down much more tightly than we've ever been able to before. So keeping that in mind, you know, ultimately, I think the trick to identifying and stopping runtime attacks in this microservices world is kind of think about first, how can we measure the application? How can we understand what it's supposed to do in a way that doesn't add overhead, right, and doesn't add friction to the application development teams? First, then we can just monitor for deviations and changes, right? We can understand and look for anything that's outside the norm. And then finally, we can take that information we've built up based on how that application is supposed to behave using that we've extracted using BPF, and we can start to enforce security policies to limit it to only performing those actions, right? And, you know, this is a cycle that can repeat and repeat and repeat until you've ultimately kind of boxed that application in so that it no longer has degrees of freedom, right, to have an attacker take a path that the application team never really thought about. All right. So almost done with the slide where I'm about to get to a live demo. So the live demo is going to include three different sets of technology. The first is Cilium. Cilium, again, is the core networking, security, and visibility enforcement layer built on BPF. Cilium has an extensibility mechanism that you can pass in other identity information about the workloads, and Cilium can enforce based on that. So we're also plugging into events from the container runtime, in this case, Docker to understand when there's been a Docker run versus when there's been a Docker exec, and to be able to tell the difference between those two things. Right? Finally, we're using BCC and a, and a set of hook points called kernel or k-probes right, to be able to understand you know, when a connect happens or when a fork happens or when an exec happens and extract additional metadata that we can then feed into um, Cilium for making enforcement decisions. So we'll show a couple things, but the one thing I really want you to focus in on is something that I'm super excited about because, you know, since the early days, you know, the dawn of time in networking, and probably some people were drawing network diagrams on cave walls, right? You know, how did you identify a source in a firewall rule? It was always an IP address, right? And the problem is with Kubernetes, everything in a pod is a single network namespace. It all has one IP address. So any traditional firewall, whether it's IP tables, or even a sidecar proxy, can't tell the difference between different things coming from that pod because it all comes with the same IP address. It can't tell the difference between it coming from the main container, a sidecar, and a NIC container. It can't tell the difference between it you know, being a kubectl exec versus the main process. That's really what we want to show. We want to show the power of BPF to be able to pull in this operating system level granularity so that we can lock each one of these um, you know, bits of code execution down to exactly the minimal workflow that they need to and nothing else. All right, so demo time. Let's see, let's hope this. All right, is that big enough for people to see? No? All right, that's what I was afraid of. All right. Let's see. Let me just. Is that big enough? Because there's got to be a lot of windows here. <laughs> okay, we'll get started. So long story short, this is a basic, this is a standard Minikube environment. I can do Minikube SSH, you know, you name, so you name, right? You see, I'm running a 415 kernel. This is just a stock Minikube, right? We're going to use BPF to add additional microservices where filtering and intelligence um, to this Kubernetes environment. So how many of you are familiar with the guestbook demo from Kubernetes? I see not many. Really? Oh, this is like the first one, first thing I ever did with Kubernetes. So maybe, maybe it's no longer the main demo anymore. Um, so let's see. So we have a variant of this called the Death Star guestbook. 
All right, and so it looks like the guest book already has one entry. It says, hi, thanks for attending my KubeCon talk. Well, that's nice. So let's make sure that my demo environment is still up. Let's say, hmm, I hope no one learns about the exhaust port vulnerability. All right, let's see if this is up. Yep, okay, so it's still up. We see the messages. Basically, it's a pretty simple PHP-based front end that stores it in Redis and reads it back. All right, so let's say your application development teams um, just told you that they have now deployed a new version of this guest book, right? They, you know, they pulled in this nice graphic, et cetera. How do you as a security team kind of understand what's going on inside that environment? So let me see where I can get this window. All right, so we're able to use BPF here, all right? to just do a core trace, right? We're tracing all these system calls, so we understand exactly what's going inside this one pod. So you can see that inside this single pod, we actually have an init container, right, called init GitHub download, right? And we can see from Cilium, right, that it's reaching out, not just to an IP address, but to, we can actually see the full DNS name that it's reaching out to on port 80. We can see up here we have a logging sidecar. We can see all the different things that have been executed inside. What's that? Does it need it bigger? Uh, yeah, well, there's, unfortunately, there's a lot of windows in this demo workflow, <laughs> so this isn't all going to work. Um, right, and then we can see up here our main actual process. This is the front end, right? It's running, um, it's running Apache 2, right, with PHP, and it's accessing the, the Redis backend. So, right, without, you know, getting in the way of any of our developers or making them tell us anything, right, we've auto-extracted all this information about their app and how it changes. All right. So, our developers have also said, let me just exit and see if I can just keep using this window. Yeah, our developers have also said that they've had an initial security policy in place. So, that sounds good. We love it when developers do security, right? So front end policy one here. You can see here, okay, great. I'm taking the guest book front end and I'm only allowing it to talk on port 6379 to my Redis backend. That sounds good, right? But down here we can see that, you know, this isn't so good, right? We also expose port 80 to the entire world, right? It's hard to know, you know, they've got to reach out to this Logly and they've got to reach out to GitHub. I don't know the IP addresses there. So just open it up to the whole world, right? It's a pretty common, common problem, right? So what that means, right, is that I could, you know, if I get compromised, you know, I can access any endpoint out there, right? So for example, if I go kubectl exec, let me see. I'm going to just try to do this all in one window. It might take a little longer, but. All right, I can do curl http google.com. All right, let's see, let me, oh, sorry, let me just make sure that this is actually the policy that's applied. All right, so. See, so now right, I have that world open, so it doesn't matter that my app's only supposed to access those you know, two sites, Logly and GitHub, it's able, if it's compromised, it's able to access anything. So that's obviously not good, right? So let's do a little better than that. So here I've got an example of a simple Cilium network policy that starts to pull in more service identity information. The big part that's changed here, right, is here. I actually have these two DNS rules. I can do full DNS names, I can do wild cards, I can pull that in, and now I can apply a policy, right, that is fully DNS and service aware to lock down. So let's go kubectl apply policy two. Right now, if I go back into that container, all right, I curl Google, now I can't access Google anymore, right? So that's a good start, starting to lock things down, right? But, you know, I'm in my main pod here, and I'm still able to access, for example, GitHub. Well, why does my main pod need to access GitHub if it's compromised, right? It shouldn't. My init container needed to, right? This comes back to the idea that traditionally, right, a firewall can't tell the difference between what's going on inside container and what's going on, you know, it can't tell that it's just the init container, right? So it has to allow it for the entire container. So let's do a little bit better then, right? 
So I'm going to apply that, but I'm also just going to cat it quickly so you can see. So this is bringing in some of that container awareness, right? We can actually split these things out. We can say, well, the only thing that should be able to talk to Redis, for example, is that main PHP front end container. The only thing that should be able to talk to Logly, right, um, is that logging sidecar. And the only thing that should be able to talk to GitHub is actually that init container, right? So again, we're continuing to constrain and constrain and constrain, right? And so why is this important, right? So if I look, right, right now, if my sidecar gets compromised, right, it can actually still access my Redis server, even though there's no reason it should, right? So I can do kubectl exec. And in this case, I'm going to explicitly say I want to go into the logging sidecar. Right. So, of course, the logging sidecar should be able to do things like curl logly, right? Right, so good, that returns. All right, but now I've enforced this policy that's locking it down from a container level, right? So, what I won't be able to do here now is if I do the Redis, right, and so the Redis master. Right, it's not able to access Redis. So this is great now, right? If my sidecar gets compromised, right, I'm not exposed, right? But like we saw before, you know, if I have debug access to my main Redis pod, right, I can still access Redis, right? So if I go in here and I do Redis CLI, right, I can do get messages, and I can access the Redis data store. So what if we don't want people, we want to be able to give people debug access, right, but we don't want to be able to give them, um, them to be able to access our sensitive data stores. So that's what this last policy is. All right, notice I put in here, I say, well, it has to be of type run. This means it has to be that root process that was actually kicked off by your trusted, you know, CI, CD workflow. It's not just some, you know, application ops team running in there and applying it and, you know, accessing it. So let's really quickly do front end policy four. All right, now if we kubectl exec back in there, we are in the PHP Redis, right? Now we hang, right? So we're actually able to tell the difference between a kubectl exec and the main process. But I may have cheated, right? How do we know the actual main process is still able to access, right? We've got to go back and check. All right, so let's test the demo gods. All right, it worked, right? So we're actually able to be doing firewalling not based on source IP address, but actually based on the specific process that sent this traffic inside of Kubernetes, right? So this is why I'm kind of so excited about BPF and the potential of kind of what it's able to do in terms of locking down things more and more tightly so that our application workloads, right, have kind of nowhere to move if they get compromised. So definitely, you know, I, Cilium and BPF in my mind are just undoubtedly a critical part of the overall kind of next generation microservices stack. I think Envoy is a big part, plays nicely with Istio as well and Kubernetes. Definitely would be happy to chat with you more about that. Um, you know, stop by our booth. Um, my co-founder, Thomas, has a talk tomorrow at 2.30 or 2.50 on some very cool, um, some very cool uh, kind of chaos testing stuff he's doing. So with that, I will say thanks and uh, take some questions. Yep. I don't know if I like that smile on his face. This is going to be a tough oh, question. thanks for the presentation. <laughs> uh, simple question: Is it possible to filter traffic between containers in one pod? In one pod? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Are you asking me to show you right now, or? <laughs> hey, we can we can grab some time later, and I'll yeah. I'll have to think about whether it should work actually here. Yeah, it definitely will work. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're using Cilium in a very large cluster, like two. Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing. Um, um, if you're using Cilium in a very large cluster, like 300 plus nodes with like ten, many tens of thousands of pods, sort of how do you find scaling? Um, I know other CNIs kind of can have issues and yeah. Did you see the? Did you see? Uh, so the question was about scale in large scale environments. Can um, I ask everyone to leave Cilium? quietly? So thanks. 
Yeah, it's a good question. Have you seen the, the 1.5 release blog that we put out with Cilium? So we've done an incredible, like, we've validated Cilium up to 5,000 nodes of physical case worker nodes, um, 20,000 plus pods, um, and I think 20K services. So we've done a ton of work. Some of the largest Kubernetes users out there are, are already using or shifting to Cilium because of like a lot of the scale benefits. Because a lot of the things around IP tables don't, you know, it doesn't matter if you're running 20, 20 nodes or something like that. It really matters when you're running large scale environments. Yep. Oh, sorry. Right here? I don't know. Or whatever. <laughs> I got overruled, I guess. Uh, how you track your injection into BPF? So if when your container, when your controller is restarted, how you validate that BPF rules are still in kernel and not removed? How does it validate that BPF hooks are still? Uh, I mean that uh, you are injecting your BPF code into kernel. It is mm -hmm. running there, but. Uh, so the, w the way the networking setup happens is the network connectivity won't even be set. Like the BPF program is required for the pod to have network access. So if something happens and the BPF program can't be created, the pod will actually be disconnected. Right. So it's kind of a fail, essentially has fail close semantics, not fail open. So you need very specific uh, Linux capabilities to be able to do that. So that's the general um, kind of protection mechanism. And you aren't able, so a, a pod, for example, is not able to remove its BPF program. It's actually running in a different, it's running outside the VETH pair. I'm happy to walk you through kind of the details of that later. Yep. Uh, would you mind uploading your demo to GitHub? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to clean it up a little more, but yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> like, like I mentioned, this, that, that code is, is prototype code. That's why I use BCC. Um, we'll fold some of this capability into kind of Cilium proper over time. If you're interested in tracking that or even participating, let me know. Um, yep. Um, do security between the clusters? So what yeah, you showed yeah. us? So policies between two different Kubernetes Exactly. Clusters. So you could have labels in one cluster and labels in another cluster and still say, like, you know, you know, tenant Dan can talk to tenant Dan regardless of what cluster they're in. That's part of why Cilium kind of more natively transfers the identity, right? IP addresses may not be meaningful across clusters, but Cilium actually embeds the identity in the traffic. There, there's a mode of Cilium that you can do that it actually tags the packet, yeah. Yeah. Um, so in addition to like multi-cluster. second question, is that yeah, um, double dipping? Can you handle like going from sort of a pod to a VM or some other platform? You're asking, like, could the tra so Cilium itself and all BPF is not at all specific to containers, right? It's a core Linux primitive. Um, the, the reason we start out in containers is really two reasons. One is that containers tend to be running with new kernels, and BPF benefits from running a newer kernel. It's less of an issue now, but that's why we started out there. Um, the second thing is Cilium kind of fundamentally is about pulling in these richer notions of identity than an IP address. With Kubernetes, there's automatic identity that we can automatically extract, like labels and those types of things. If you pull up a VM, the question is, well, what, who gives us the identity of that VM? So there are actually APIs on Cilium that you can kind of integrate with to pass it the identity information. But that's something that you have to explicitly integrate with if it's a VM, for example, versus it kind of being automatically extracted in a Kubernetes environment. Yep. Yeah, when the policy gets applied to the port, what happens to the connectivity? to so, the pod. When you reapply the policy, uh -huh. like you change the policy, you re reapply it during the application of the policy. Oh, what yeah. happens so this is to one of the things that's really cool about BPF. So I, I didn't go into this level of detail because I didn't want to bore the hell of most of you. But um, BPF actually supports atomic swap of programs. Right? So you can guarantee that like a set of packets will, you know, that there's there's no like packet flowing through that hook point like after you've removed the, the first one, but before you've applied the second one. Like, there's no gap there. You're basically atomically swapping one program for another, and it guarantees that that trace point is not invoked. You know, that, that trace point is not passed um, until the new program is actually in place. No, 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 I'm saying there's no, there's no packet that's allowed to pass without a BPF program executing if you have something registered. We're not actually unregistering that BPF program. We're atomically swapping in a new one. Yep. 
So if I understand correctly, Cilium, what Cilium does is it um, compiles this bytecode and inserts it into BPF, right? So every time something changes on my cluster, you have to recompile and... <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good question. There's actually two answers to it. So the first is that's part of what's great about BPF maps, right? So for example, if a new security rule gets pushed down or a new endpoint pops up, we don't have to recompile the BPF program. We might insert something into a BPF map, but I mentioned that's an extremely lightweight operation, right? That the user space thing would just shove another entry into a BPF map. The next time the kernel program does a lookup on, that entry will be in there. Um, second thing is, you know, there may be like, if there's meaningful changes to the control flow, um, you would potentially have to recompile the BPF program. Um, but we've just introduced in a recent version of Cilium, essentially BPF templating. So if it's a similar program, we're actually able to cache that and only compile once. So there's been, um, this is kind of part of that scale work that the team has done that's super impressive. Mm -hmm. So are you seeing people doing anything particularly novel with control flow, like their own sort of custom things? With control flow? You're saying like sort of about sort of rather than sort of just use like the, the default sort of um, built-ins, you know, are people doing sort of like kind of clever you're things that you've seen so far? Control flow, like you're saying like different BPF programs? Or? Yeah, yeah, like, you know, if you, out of the box, you're probably not going to write your own BPF program straight off. Mm -hmm. You know, are you seeing people writing their own that are doing like kind of oh, really like advanced Cilium? things? Yeah, yeah. With Cilium, we don't really expose like the ability to attach your own BPF programs. Again, it kind of goes back to that split between what I mentioned with BCC. BCC more is kind of craft your own BPF programs. Most people using Cilium want to benefit, want to get the performance benefits and the visibility benefits and all of that, but they don't really want to deal with writing, you know, pseudo C code and dealing with the BPF verifier. Cool. Okay, let's right. take this to the hallway track. I think we need to. Right, thanks a lot, Patrick. Have a good one. Thanks.